So all the talk at the moment um, in social media is LinkedIn. Uh, all of a sudden everyone's paying attention to it, no one's quite sure why, but one of the drivers is uh, probably the Cambridge Analytica thing at Facebook, uh, privacy, hate speech, you know, everything bad that we, <laughs> that we can think of about the internet, you can find it all on Facebook and elsewhere. And more and more businesses, certainly in professional services, are starting to think, well, maybe we ought to start paying attention to this, this LinkedIn thing. Uh, and revisit it and try and figure it out. Now, at the end of the day, LinkedIn is a piece of software. Facebook's a piece of software. Uh, but let's talk about LinkedIn. LinkedIn's a piece of software, and just like any other software that you'd use in your business, whether it's your back office system, your CRM system, your RAP platform, whatever it is, unless you've been trained in how to <coughs> use it, you will never see the full value of it. And LinkedIn is exactly just like that. Um, most people have not had any training on LinkedIn at all. Um, so what I'm going to try and do is I'm going to do, do a bit of training on LinkedIn, but also just to sort of open your minds as to what is actually possible, because LinkedIn is, is amazing. And when you look at uh, Facebook and LinkedIn and think about who these, who these platforms run by, Facebook's run by a guy who was a student and he's not done anything else. And LinkedIn is run by Microsoft, who own it who have been around the block a bit when it comes to technology and the internet. And really interesting to hear that guy on, on the radio this morning from, from um, Microsoft. LinkedIn is a very, very shareholder focused company. Um, so they are determined that the product you get is good. But as I said, like in, if you don't know how to use the product, um, it's hopeless. So we're gonna show you a little bit of background as to what LinkedIn in, uh, is and how it works. Um, some very specific things that you can do, so certainly on your profile, that's as good a place as any to start. We've, we've got some time, we'll talk about some connection scripts, uh, which just uh, open doors by, by magic. Um, again, if I've got your business card, great. If you haven't, uh, make sure you give it to me and I will send you those scripts separately as well, because I'm not gonna show them all uh, this afternoon. So let's just, just pile in there. Um, oh yeah, th let's just talk about business cards that we talked about this morning. LinkedIn reckons it's gonna kill the business card, the humble business card. If you've got the LinkedIn app on your phone, uh, just about here is one of those that is dedicated to you. And what you can do is you can uh, show yours, make it visible on your app and go up to anybody else and they can scan it with their mobile phone and they go straight to your LinkedIn profile. So if you were to scan that, it goes straight to your LinkedIn profile. But every, everybody on LinkedIn has got their own unique one of those. Now, one of the things you could do is print that on the back of your business card. Most people, when they see one of those these days, kind of know, oh, I need to get my phone out for this. So just print it out, stick it on the back of your, on the, on the back of your business card, and some people will inevitably want to scan it and they can find you on LinkedIn nice, nice and quickly. Another thing you want to do is maybe get your LinkedIn address. Everyone's got their own unique URL. Uh, print that on your business card as well. But I'll show you uh, something you need to do first before we do that. So, all right, let's have a quick show of hands if you're on LinkedIn. Let's have a quick show of hands. Okay, fantastic. Now put your hands up, now put your hands up if you know why you're on LinkedIn. <laughs> <coughs> not quite sure. So it's a different kind of kettle of fish. So we're all on there. We're not quite sure why. Maybe we were looking for a job once upon a time. Uh, and someone said perhaps LinkedIn is the place to go, stick your CV on there, hope for the best. Um, even the really big boys of marketing these days are saying LinkedIn is where the action is. This is Gary Vaynerchuk, if you don't know who he is. Uh, he, he used to have, um, his, he, and his dad used to have a wine store in Brooklyn, in New York. Um, and, you know, there's hundreds of wine stores in New York, if not thousands. And he had a bit of a marketing head when he was a young lad. So how can we differentiate ourselves from all the other wine stores? They all sold the same, same stuff. They all give the same advice. How do we differentiate ourselves? And around the time, YouTube was just starting to get going. And he thought, oh, why don't we do wine tastings on video? Stick them on my website, stick them on YouTube and the rest is history. Gary now runs, I think, what's the largest advertising agency in the world. He speaks all around the world. Um, and when someone like him says LinkedIn is a, is a big deal, we need to start paying attention. So he's muscling in on my act now, but never mind. So the problem with, problem with most people when we go on LinkedIn, uh, my goodness, we waste a lot of time. 
Uh, we all do it. We go onto LinkedIn, whether it's on the app or the desktop version, and the first thing we see is the news feed, and we have a quick scroll down there, and it's kind of relevant to you. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Um, or then we see the little red dot, top right hand corner, oh, someone sent me a message, or someone wants to connect. And sure enough, a couple of people want to connect, and we agonize over, should I be connecting with these people, yes or no? Uh, then maybe you do a status update, then you read some other people's status updates. They say, oh, yeah, I'm a member of that group, let's go and see what's going on in that group. Nothing. Then you have a look. You know, it's just so woolly. We get absolutely nowhere with it. Hands up anyone in this room who has a LinkedIn plan that's written down. Good. Glad I came. So first thing to do, we get a plan, then we suddenly find that, that the small amount of time that we've, that we've got available, even a minute a day on LinkedIn will be more than sufficient. But there is some work to do before we get to that lovely minute a day. There is still the perception that LinkedIn is nothing more than a fancy job site. Um, that's fair enough. I do work in uh, schools from anyone age 13, about right up to 25 now. Um, you can join LinkedIn from the age of 13. They've lowered the age. Um, and the thinking being, Microsoft, smart again, they know that kids, when they start thinking about their careers, my wife is a career head for a secondary school, they know that kids are gonna, they've got mobile devices in their hands, and it's inevitable that they will look for universities, they'll look for jobs using their mobile device. So LinkedIn wants to get them in early. So I show kids how to transition from fun social networking to professional social networking as well. So a um, bunch of kids have just done their A-levels this year. Some have just gone on to university. Quite a few of them, I'm trying to get them onto LinkedIn now. They don't have to connect with anyone, but they're starting to build their professional story. So they, many of them are using LinkedIn to look at universities, to follow influencers, to follow companies, just to start getting the hang of using this as a tool to help them in their careers. So what is LinkedIn? I'm just gonna bungle these up because it's whatever you personally want it to be. I'm guessing that many of you here are thinking, okay, if I'm on LinkedIn, it'd be quite nice if we could find some clients. But there are other reasons why you might want to use it as well. Uh, yes, you might be looking for a job. Yes, you might just want it to read the news in a different environment. If you've, I don't know if you've noticed recently, uh, particularly on the desktop version, you get the daily news. The main world news is on LinkedIn. So they're trying to buddy up with news sites as well. It's a sales tool. You can do ads. There's a whole thing called LinkedIn <coughs> Learning where there are thousands of training videos on, you name it, any business topic and non-business topics, you can watch these videos. Most of them are for free. It's called LinkedIn Learning. So it's whatever you want it to be. But what LinkedIn is trying to do is to make it a website that is absolutely indispensable to all its users. If you want to do selling, you can do that on LinkedIn. Doing networking, you can do it on LinkedIn. If you want to post blogs, you can do that on LinkedIn. You want to post your company numbers, you can do that on LinkedIn. You want to ad advertise jobs or st search for jobs, you can do it all on LinkedIn. And what LinkedIn does is they reward you for treating it as a business resource. And I'll explain a bit more. And the best way they reward people is they make your posts more visible and they make you more visible in the search results. Remember what I said earlier about social networking, social media now is, is a, are search engines? And that is what drives LinkedIn. It is the people search engine. You want to find certain types of expertise. If someone, you go to a business event and someone says, yeah, the big issue in my business is getting a photocopier supplier, we can go on a LinkedIn and we can find photocopier suppliers. So it's a search engine. And if we're on LinkedIn, we want to try and leverage that and make sure that we are being found in the search engines. I'm going to show you a few things this afternoon. If you do nothing else, um, get the search engine bit right. And it will, if you follow what I'm going to show you, it will make an immediate and measurable difference to your visibility on LinkedIn. It, literally immediately. You'll start appearing on the first page of search results. And that's where you've got to be. You don't want to be on page 2, page 10, or page 100. You want to be on page 1, and I'll show you how to do that. Now, LinkedIn's got 650 million members, so we've got to make sure that you get found for your expertise when people are using it as a search engine. And I think one of the themes that I've been talking about today is, is that there is this perception with all these online tools that it's all about the technology. And I think it's actually got nothing to do with technology at all and everything to do with technique. 
how we interact with and engage with other people. The tools are there just as they're vehicles for us to communicate. And that's why even LinkedIn has got its own messaging tool built into it now, and quite good it is too. So here's the facts of life. If you are on LinkedIn, you are marketing yourself, full stop. If you are not already receiving inquiries out of the blue from complete strangers on LinkedIn, arguably you're not marketing yourself as well as you could be. So that's going to be the focus today. You should, with 650 million people on the site, you should be getting inquiries already out of the blue from people you've never met. So we'll show you how to make that happen. This is kind of how it works. Someone goes onto LinkedIn, they're searching for someone with expertise. And hopefully they're going to find you. And the way you're going to portray yourself is through your profile, through the keywords that you use on your profile, what you actually do on LinkedIn on a day-to-day -day basis, and the hashtags that you use. Now, I know that there'll be people in this room thinking, I've heard this word hashtags before, but actually not quite sure what it means. So let's just get that one out of the way. Hashtags apply to pretty well any social networking platform, but predominantly on Twitter um, and LinkedIn, and actually those are the main ones, Twitter and, Twitter and LinkedIn. Now, if so this is how a hashtag works. Maybe you got up this morning at 5 a.m., and you went for your morning run, as you do, and you came back in and you thought, well, I need to tell the world that I've been for a morning run. So you go onto Twitter or LinkedIn and you type in morning run done, uh, feeling great. Then you put hashtag fitness and maybe hashtag smug. So what the hashtag does is two things. One, it adds a little bit of emphasis to what you've just said. Been for a run, so you might put hashtag fitness. It will also, the other thing it does is it makes your tweet or your post much, much more visible in search results. Because there are people using Twitter and LinkedIn as search engines. And some people want to go onto Twitter and they want to find out, right, what are the tweets out there today for people who are into fitness? So they'll type into the search box on Twitter, hashtag fitness, and your post will appear in their search results simply because you put hashtag fitness in there. Okay, so when we get the general election, that's coming up around the corner, there will inevitably be the leaders' debates. Okay, and people, as they do, will want to comment on what's going on on the TV. They'll be watching it and they'll be tweeting it and say, doesn't Corbyn, can't he dress properly? And they'll be saying, doesn't Boris look a buffoon? And so on and so forth. But there'll be a hashtag that everybody uses in all their posts. And in the last uh, general election, when the leaders' debate was on TV, the hashtag was hashtag leaders' debate. And now what that means is you could then just click on, tap on hashtag leaders debate, and it will only show you the tweets that have got that hashtag. So you don't get all the other rubbish about football and all, all the other nonsense and Brexit going on. You just see that stuff. Interestingly, there was another hashtag that, was, that started to get a bit of traction that people were using, and it was hashtag mass debate, <laughs> which is much more fun, that one. So hashtags add emphasis, but they also make your post much more visible in the search results. So you need to be using hashtags in your posts on LinkedIn, but we'll come on to that in a minute. So someone does their search, they're looking for an expert, whatever, and a whole bunch of people come up in the search results, including your good self. We've done our search, so what we might want to do is go and actually talk to you. So through the LinkedIn system, we can either send a message, or we can connect with someone, or we can follow someone. We exchange a few messages through the system, and at some point, we've got to get, go and have a coffee, yeah, or a Skype, whatever. That's my plan on LinkedIn. Appear in the search results for certain words, to communicate, and then to get them off LinkedIn and into a coffee shop where we can then do what normally happens in business. It's extremely unlikely that you'll ever do a mortgage or a pension or investment for someone without having actually spoke to them on the phone or on Skype or something like that. It does happen, but it certainly won't happen through the LinkedIn messaging system. So at some point, you've got to do the human thing, meet up with them or have a Skype, whatever it is, yeah? And hopefully if that goes well, we end up in a champagne bar. That's kind of how it all works on LinkedIn. One of the things I try to do is to treat LinkedIn as the beginning of my value ladder. 
I use it to start conversations, to get conversations going, to try and help people out with issues that are going on in their business that I can't necessarily help with, but I can introduce them to people who can help with them. Remember that from earlier. So I'm trying to get people off LinkedIn and onto my value. In, I've got a group on, for financial advisors on LinkedIn. So arguably, that is one step on my value ladder. But I'm trying to get them off LinkedIn and up here. That's where I'm going. And we remember the value ladder for a dentist and so on, and the financial advisors as well. Okay, so we need to start asking ourselves some questions about our LinkedIn profile. Does it capture attention immediately? Particularly the attention of your perfect client. Remember we talked about this this morning, we've got to get a picture of who is our absolute, you might have several perfect clients, but I suspect you've got one main one. And if your perfect client is heart surgeons, if a heart surgeon found you in the search engines and they looked at your profile, would they linger? Would they hang around? Would they want to read a bit more? It's got to get their attention. Is it written for them? Does it empathise with their problems? So if we specialise in heart surgeons, we know what their problems are. And when they read your profile, they've got to get a sense of, oh yeah, this person knows, knows me. They know what, I'm, what my issues are. I'm going to read a bit more. Does it communicate in a tone that is unique to you? In other words, are we differentiating ourselves from other financial advisors who work with, with heart surgeons? I'll give you an example in a minute. Are we avoiding unnecessary jargon? We need a little bit of jargon, but not too much, because some people, they, they know what they're talking about, they know what they're looking for, they're looking for an expert on SIPs maybe, yeah, or something like that, they'll type that in. And is there a call to action? Now when you look at this, 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 this is good old school sales stuff. Do we know who we're targeting? Do we get their attention? Are we differentiating? And are we asking for a call to action? Remembering that underpinning all of this is this good old fashioned concept that people buy people. Always did, always will, and they do on social media as well. And this is when social media starts coming into its own. When you realize this, that it's not about technology, but it's everything to do with technique. So it, this is kind of the obvious one. It goes without saying that everything we put out there on social media, whether it's on LinkedIn, Twitter, wherever, is going to impact the people's perception of us. Um, we have another photographer in our family. My uh, wife has a cousin um, who's early 30s, building up his photography business. Really nice guy, lovely young family, absolutely fabulous guy. And if you said to me you were looking for someone to do a, your LinkedIn profile photo, if I didn't recommend you to my brother, I'd say, oh, go check out my wife's cousin. He's great. And so you would go and do that. You check him out on social media, as you do, and you would be horrified by what you saw. Because this guy online, he's a completely different person online. Um, I've done some work with an internet psychologist, and he tells me that all of us to a greater or lesser degree, when we do stuff online, we tend to reveal a bit more about ourselves than we might necessarily do face to face. Uh, and he calls it the werewolf effect. Uh, and my wife's cousin is, is the werewolf. I mean, and he's just effing and blinding. He's having a go at Simon Cowell, gets in the neck a lot from him. Football managers, politicians, he's having a go at everybody. And if you saw his profile, you go, is this the same guy? And that wouldn't reflect very well on me. So we've, this is something to, to important. But you're professional people, so you're not going to do that. Uh, just a couple of numbers. All the research shows, and don't forget, you are probably dealing with B to C. The, the number, the blur, there's a blurring of a line between B to B and B to C. It doesn't matter anymore. The fact is, all the research is showing is that you can get leads from this site. But it's the quality of the leads that I'm interested in. Now, I did some research on my own website, um, and I discovered, because I look at my stats, that people who've come to my website from LinkedIn stick around for 10 minutes on my website. A bounce rate of half a percent. Wow. Everybody else sticks around for four minutes, bounce rate 23%. So that's still quite good, but I'll take that one any day. Now, why is it that way? because I have built my website deliberately to appeal to LinkedIn members. Deliberately written in that, to do it that way. So I'm arguing 
that if I get my perfect client avatar correct, um, I'm going to get very, very good quality people visiting my website. I've now got to convert them. That's the next thing. But that was for another time. And whatever set of stats that you look at, as a result of looking at your profile on either Twitter or Facebook or LinkedIn, you're far more likely to end up in a conversation that will lead to business after they've looked at your LinkedIn profile. Out of all the social networking platforms and tools that are out there, LinkedIn appears highest in search results on Google. So if you've got a profile on all of those platforms, your LinkedIn profile will very often, if it's fully completed, and I stress fully completed, your LinkedIn profile will appear third place in Google search results for your name. And so if I type in my name into Google, uh, the governor of Maryland comes up top, my website comes up second, my LinkedIn profile comes in third. Now it changes slightly every single day because Google's constantly tweaking its, its algorithm. So we appear high. Now when you ask people, how has LinkedIn helped you? This is what they say. These are people who are really crushing it on LinkedIn. The number one thing is they say is they use it to research people and companies, thus proving that it's being used as a search engine. Second, reconnect with past associates and colleagues. I mean, there's plenty of people I've worked with in the past I'd rather not reconnect with, but there we have it. And number three, build relationships with people who could influence potential customers. So what this is saying is that if you and I connect on LinkedIn, there's a good chance that you and I will never do business together. But what is far more likely to happen is I'll recommend you to my friend here and hopefully you'll recommend me to your friend over there. So it's the second degree and third degree connections which is where it's all powerful. Compared to other social networking platforms, making professional connections, LinkedIn way ahead. Improving the effect of my referral network, way ahead. Building my brand identity, way ahead. Cultivating client prospects, way ahead, blah, blah, blah. This thing works. So, let's dig a bit deeper. LinkedIn fundamentally has three core themes going on made up of 10 core elements. The three themes are identity and reputation at a personal corporate level, networking, connecting other people together, professional networking in other words, and building your own network. Nothing wrong with building your own network, but that's where the magic happens. And it's about knowledge, learning, and sharing. I mean, you could go on to just use LinkedIn as a tool to read up about topics that you're interested in. If you're interested in golf, go on to LinkedIn, type in golf in the search box, and you'll be amazed what you'll discover. Tons of articles, blogs, people, people who love golf, groups about golf, companies that specialize in golf, you can use it for a whole variety of different things. Now, the 10 core elements are these, and most of you in this room are only using that bit. Just imagine if we could appear in search results for all of those particular sections. This is one of the things, we're not using LinkedIn in depth or in as much depth as we could do. So I'll explain some of these things as well. Now, lots of people say it's all B2B, it's only about business people. Uh, that's fine. Uh, there's something like 20 million company pages on LinkedIn, but there's 650 million individuals on LinkedIn. And every single occupation that you can think of is on LinkedIn. So the idea that this is just a B2B site is nonsense. It's a B2C website, first and foremost, with a heavy element of B2B. And you're looking at that one there. Uh, I mean, it's amazing. Porn stars are on LinkedIn. Uh, just everybody is on LinkedIn. But mermaids, so maybe you want a, a mermaid to come along to your event that you're putting on. I found a couple uh, that you could hire. Some people say, isn't LinkedIn a bit spammy? Well, I quite like this. I always have a laugh at the spam. You get, oh, this is one I got a while back. I thought, how cool is that? They think I'm in the market for a, for a super. I'll have two. Why not? Financial advisors tell me, uh, what about all the bloody recruiters uh, on LinkedIn? Fair enough. So I've got financial advisors now. I've turned, it, I've turned it around the other way. And I've said, OK, so why don't you, on your LinkedIn profile, have a little section that says you are an expert on financial planning and personal finance for recruiters. Visit our website and download our free guide 
15 ways for recruiters to increase their income in retirement without spending more money. Do you think they'll, some of those will take that up? Of course they will. Build a completely separate website, just a one-page job. So if these people are coming to you, then milk it. That's basically the, basically the way to go. Okay, so let's dig. First thing, have a plan. We've established that none of you in the room have got a LinkedIn plan. As long as it's on the back of an envelope, something's written down. Uh, do you know, uh, we'll go back to the seminars thing I was talking about this morning. The number one reason why financial advisors' seminars fail is because they don't have a plan. They have not written down their objectives for this seminar. You need to have two objectives. An objective for you and an objective for each member of the audience. And by that I mean, what is it that you want them to do or say or remember or act on or purchase as a result? As soon as you've got that kind of focus, then it all starts coming together. It's the same with LinkedIn as well. If you've got some focus as to what you want to achieve and what your objectives are, then you suddenly start finding your, the way you use LinkedIn changes and becomes much more uh, tailored to, to making it happen. So you'll, it needs to be as simple as this. Why are you on LinkedIn? What are you trying to achieve? And then measuring results. LinkedIn gives you lots of numbers <coughs> within the site. Um, we'll show you some of those in a minute or two. So I'm going to show you my LinkedIn plan. It's to A, attract speaking and training business, to be visible where people who book speakers and trainers are, and there must be a couple of million event professionals and conference organisers on LinkedIn, to have conversations with these people that lead them to the coffee shop, but to take them off the site. So these are my target audiences, meeting planners and conference organisers, financial advisors, other speakers, and school careers leads because I want to get into schools to do talks. That's my plan. How hard is that to put together? But the fact that I've written it down makes me so much more focused. You see what I did here? Look, A, B, C, D, A, B, C. Anyway, profile pages. Now, so lots of people say, Phil, I get all this, but this is surely going to take time. This bit takes time. Can't deny that. But most of you, you've already got some sort of profile on there. What I'm going to suggest is, is that we're going to do some tweaking and we're going to add some, add some things. I'm going to show you what we're going to add in a minute or two. So we get the profile sorted. The rest of what I'm going to tell you then becomes super easy. And LinkedIn gives us lots of evidence. And they say uh, people with fully completed profiles have far more conversations than everybody else. So it's, an, it's a no-brainer. Yep. There's no point in being on the site if you don't use it properly. Other mistakes people make are, bizarrely, not putting their contact details on there. Why would you not do that? Not engaging with other people and their content. In other words, not saying great posts to. Really enjoyed that. Not hitting the like button. Do what human beings do. If you're in a room and people are chatting away and you're just standing there with your mouth shut, not talking to someone, how would they feel about that? It's the same on LinkedIn. A lot of people think about social media because it's technology and it's easy and it's cheap. It's a big shortcut to writing business. No, it isn't. You've got to still, on, online, you've got to behave in the same way that you behave here in the real world. So we've got to remember that stuff. Also, not everyone finds you on LinkedIn. I had a situation where I was speaking at a uh, PFS event or something um, some years ago, and a lady comes up to me, um, and she gave me a business card. Uh, she was from uh, Singapore, so she gave me a business card with two hands. Let's get this bit. Do you know what I saying this morning about doing this? I'm obsessed with business cards, I'm sorry. Uh, she didn't know. She came up to me, she presented it to me with two hands, and I knew what was going on here because I've spoken at events out there and I take it with two hands. Uh, now, if you give somebody a business card like that in Asia, that's your reputation shot forever. Uh, give a business card with two hands and receive it with two hands. Look at it, admire it feel it, touch it, look at it like, because in the absence of the real person, this is them. So you should treat it with the same amount of respect. So I'm going to give you a little challenge from today. From today, next time you give out a business card, give it with two hands and receive it too. Now, the first couple of times you do that, you will feel really awkward, but I can't think, I can't think of doing it any other way now these days. And again, it will differentiate. And if somebody gives you their business card, you take it with two hands, they notice that. They notice that you, rather than just going, yeah, pop it in the pocket. Anyway, so this lady comes up to me. She gives me her business card, and it says Barclays Financial Planning on it. 
She told me that when she lived in Australia, she was Barclays Financial Planning's top financial planner uh, in the country. She moved to Singapore, Barclays' top financial planner in the Asia-Pacific region. Moved to the UK, she was in the top 1% financial planners. Barclays, as you may remember, they closed down their financial planning arm. She's now looking for a job. She comes up to me and, say, and, and I said to her, hi, how are you? What's going on? How could, uh, who could I introduce you to? She said, could you introduce me to someone who's looking for a top-end financial planner? I'm sure I can help you out with that. I'll get back to you tomorrow. I go home, I type her name into LinkedIn, I found her. No photo, just her name. And I suddenly thought, that's really interesting. She presented herself as the top financial planner, which creates a picture. I go online, she could have been anyone. In fact, she was a no one online. So you've got to make sure that there's a connection between who you see in the real world and who you see in the online world as well. And the two must match up. Okay, so everybody's profile has these sections. So you can now see why you've got a job of work to do. Some of these sections are hidden in your, on your LinkedIn profile. And most people manage to get that bit done and a bit of that. When there's all this to do as well. So those are the sections of your LinkedIn profile. Now, if you want to appear high in LinkedIn search results, you need to fully complete that profile. You also need to build a large network. Now, two schools of thought on networking theory. School of thought number one is really when we're networking with people, whether it's online or face-to-face, -face, we should actually keep your network highly focused. Heart surgeons. That's it. Um, another school of thought says, connect with absolutely everybody you possibly can. Neither is right nor wrong. It's personal choice. My personal choice is keep your network small and highly focused. However, I do the exact opposite on LinkedIn because LinkedIn rewards you for having a large network. LinkedIn's got this rather quaint old fashioned idea that people should be well connected. And by well-connected, what LinkedIn means is not who you know, but how many people you know. So they like you to have a large network. And if you've got a large network, they push you higher up in the search results. Include hashtags in the posts, chat with other people online, and decide on your keywords. And we'll talk about keywords in a minute as to why they're important. So those are the things you need to do to appear high. But let's put some more flesh on the bones. Uh, let me just jump over. Okay. So let's, let's have a look at a profile page. Now I've created a kind of test that is designed to stop this happening when people look at your profile. Okay, we want people to be excited. It gets their attention when they, when they look at your profile. Now I've set a test and it's quite a high bar that your profile has to reach, okay? And this is the bar that you have to reach. You have to be irresistible, that good. Let me explain. So I sent an email to my wife. That's how we communicate. No, <laughs> she, she hires speakers to come in and motivate the kids, okay? And I said, I'm doing this presentation. Can you give me an example of, of what you might consider to be an irresistible, prof irresistible profile? Okay, so half an hour later, I get an email from her, her school, from her. No text in it, no lovey-dovey stuff. See you later, kiss, kiss, none of that. Just that attached. <laughs> Half an hour later, she sends me another. <laughs> half an hour after, she sends me another. And then I finally get a message half an hour after. She says, I like this game. And she sent me that one. So I kind of get it, what irresistible might mean. So I'm now going to show you a real, <laughs> I'm going to show you a real LinkedIn profile. And I'm going to ask you if you think this person meets this bar of being irresistible. OK, now I'm just going to put the picture up. I'm not going to give you any more information. I just want you to look at him and tell me what you think. So just have a look at him, soak him up. I'm not even gonna tell you his name or what he does. Now, at a gut human level, how do you feel about this guy? Resistible. Irresistible. No, resistible. Oh, resistible. <laughs> I, mean, that, I mean, it could have been taken in a police station for all we know. Public toilet. Public toilet, it could be. Well, I'll show you some more later. Most people eventually will say, I think he's probably all right. He looks okay. 
yeah, he looks open and friendly. That's what it's all about. That's not a professionally taken photo, but he looks friendly enough. Now, you know nothing about this guy. So this is art. And if you're at a networking event and you ask the question, what's the big issue going on in your business right now that you'd like help with? And someone says, I need a photocopier supplier who's reliable and not too expensive. This is who you will introduce them to. This is art. If you're in Milwaukee, that is. Art runs an office supplies outlet in Milwaukee. Okay? Um, let me show you what he's written on his LinkedIn profile. So I've taken this straight off his LinkedIn profile. <laughs> and there's more. So one of two things is happening here. He's either taking a mickey, and there's plenty of people who do that on LinkedIn. I love it when you find one of these profiles where people are just having a laugh. Or, this is the irresistib irresistibility factor. Or, this guy's the real deal. This guy is the real deal. The testimonials for this guy's business are off the scale. Absolutely off the He has an online service, like every other office supplies outlet does. No one uses it. Why don't they use it? Because they'd rather get in their pickup truck and drive for four hours in the hope that art will actually be there when they get there. Art figures that one office supplies outlet looks exactly the same as any other office supplies outlet wherever you are in the world. They all sell the same stuff, they sell the same product. How do you differentiate? So although he's selling photocopiers, desks, paper, paper clips, print, car print cartridges, he sells it based on him. Uh, when I first discovered this guy, I was looking at his profile, and I get a message back from Art. And it says, Dear Mr. Social Media Guy, he said, thanks for looking at my profile. I imagine you're putting together a presentation on how not to use LinkedIn. <laughs> Please feel free to use anybody, uh, feel, feel free to uh, ask any questions at any time, use any of it. And he says, if you're ever in the Milwaukee area, pop, pop on by, we'll have one of my famous lunches. That's how it works. Now, I'm not suggesting that you start using language like this on your profile, okay? What I am suggesting is we start to tell, uh, give, give people a little more insight into you as a person. What do you care about? What are your passions? What's your story? We'll come back to art. So the nice people at More to Life sent me an email with a list of all your LinkedIn profiles. And these are the words, no they didn't now. These, the <laughs> these are the words that are on your LinkedIn profiles. I reckon we could all tick off one or two of those, yeah? Now this is the problem. We're all using the same words. LinkedIn produces a list every single year of the most overused words on LinkedIn profiles. This is this year's list. It's the same pretty well every year. So we're still not differentiating ourselves at a personal level. We're all using the, we've got the same websites, same pictures, same language, same words on our LinkedIn profiles. What are these words, where do they look like they've come from? Dictionary. Dictionary and a CV, perhaps. So we've got to think about this stuff. So just a couple of quick suggestions. First of all, write it in the first person. You see these people who write their LinkedIn profiles, and apologies to anyone who's done this in this room, John has been a financial advisor for 25 years. John is a certified financial planner. John lives in the... We all know you wrote it, John. <laughs> Don't be afraid to be punchy. Don't be afraid to sell stories. Get your punctuation correct. And also, if you have a passion, say something that other people who share that passion might recognise. Those of you who love the music of John Miles may recognise that. If music is your first love, then write it in your profile. I'll give you an example in a minute. Write it aimed at your perfect, perfect client. Yes, you can be assertive and direct. Get a bit of your personality in there, put pictures and videos, infographics, whack it all in there. So, for example, a chiropractor might put this on the LinkedIn profile. I mean, why else would we be looking at a chiropractors unless our target market was chiropractors? Chiropractors know wh why people look at their profiles. They know why people look at their websites. 
They go for the lowest common denominator. They know their clients. And if I've got chronic elbow pain and I've done a search for chiropractors, that will speak to me. So we've got to get across, away from this idea that our LinkedIn profile is a CV. Equally, it's not a circus poster. Some might argue that art's profile is stepping into circus poster territory. Try and get that nice little bit of balance. Okay, so we're going to do this little, do a quick exercise right now, but we're going to do it really quick, and it's better that you actually do it properly when you get back to the office. What you need to do is to write down up to a dozen keywords that if someone typed them into the search box on LinkedIn would lead them to you. A keyword can be more than one word. So inheritance tax planning could be one keyword. Do you just want to scribble down some keywords, see what you come up with? I'm not going to take too long. Now, if you operate in a highly niche market, you probably won't be able to come up with 12 keywords. Five, six is fine, but up to 12 keywords. Okay, next thing you need to do, you said we can finish this at your leisure, is now number them in order of importance. So the single most important keyword to you that you want to be found for is number one. Okay, the next thing you need to do is to take those top five keywords Take them down to the local tattoo artist and have them tattooed on your heart. Because these words are really, really important to you online. You've identified them as important. You've ranked them as important. At the very least, print them off and stick them on your office wall. They could also act as hashtags. So if equity release is one of your um, keywords, hashtag equity release, all one word, could be something that you could use in tweets and posts and so on and so forth. So we've got five keywords. What we now need to do is to put those top five keywords into every single section of your LinkedIn profile. Remember I showed you all those sections? Every section, get those top five keywords in. Now the easy way is to literally copy and paste them in. The system still works. Far better is to weave them into some flowing prose that you write. Every section, I'll show you what I mean. So we've done a little exercise. Now the remaining keywords, just use those from time to time and pop them here and there in your profile, in your posts. But it's the top five are the ones that we're really narrowing in on. So equity release for surgeons could be a keyword. I'll explain why that's important in a minute. Okay. Just to mess up your list, you might also want to think about keywords related to services you offer, or some specific technical skills that you've got, or some specific industries that you serve. I mean, when I first started out as a young inspector, the second financial advisor I ever met on my patch in Wandsworth, I think it was, I said to him, uh, what's your target market? And he said, uh, mortgages for policemen. Um, and back in the 70s and 80s, financial advisors were much more niched down than they are today, but that's another story. Uh, target industry, so buzzwords, not too many, but get one or two in as keywords. Any business skills you've got, and also, if you have a specific location that you're looking for clients, then do that. Equity release for surgeons in London, that could be a keyword. Okay. Periodically, LinkedIn gives certain parts of LinkedIn more, uh, more importance in terms of where keywords are. So last year, all these places were important to so get keywords in all these places, but they particularly wanted you to put keywords in your headline. They particularly wanted you to have a fully completed profile. They particularly wanted you to get keywords related to your location. It changes, but broadly speaking, you need to get your keywords in every section of your profile. It changes subtly, uh, but don't worry too much. Okay, next thing. Get a couple of keywords into your name. Everybody on LinkedIn gets their own unique URL. So for most people, it will say linkedin.com slash in slash John Smith 496X35Y. That's what it is. It doesn't look very good when you print it on your business card. So what you can do and should do is put 
John Smith Financial Advice or John Smith Equity Release. So I've even taken my name out and replaced it with that. Now, if some conference organiser comes along and they're looking for a keynote speaker on sales, just me doing that alone will help me to appear higher in the search results for them. Onwards. Now, maybe I met Katie at a networking event last night. I thought she got great teeth, but there was a lot of noise and she'd run out of business cards. And today I want to get in touch with her, but I can't, I don't know how to spell her name. Katie, in her profile, she has written common misspellings of her name. Now, if your name is Smith, then you don't need to do this bit. But if your name is spelt differently and could be, people could misspell it, it's a good idea to put common misspellings of your name in the summary section of your profile. Bill's got great teeth as well, and he's put that in his profile as well. Under your name, you have what's called the professional headline. What do you notice, what things do you notice about my professional headline? talking to my perfect dream customer. And it's also a question. Uh, in copywriting techniques, human beings presented with a question try to answer the question. What else do you notice about it as well? Capitalise the first letter of every word. The reason for doing that, it's a copywriting trick. It makes it look more important than it actually is. Simply by putting a capital letter at the beginning of each word. You see it in newspapers all over the place. So, write it as a question, aim it at your perfect dream client, capitalise the first letter of each one. Now, Jeremy here has put keywords in his name. Um, you didn't used to be able to do that, but you can do that now, as long as you don't abuse it like this fella has. <laughs> now, uh, that's differentiation, I guess. Uh, so, Jeremy has put that in there. Now, here's an interesting thing. One of the benefits of doing that is that if Jeremy likes somebody's content on LinkedIn, it will say, Jeremy Squibb Financial Life Planner liked this. So we don't even need to look at his profile to know what he does for a living. So this is a wee bit more advanced, but you want to just sort of think about whether, whether you do that or not. You recommend that? Um, if you're really going for the keyword thing, it's, it's a good idea. I, some, I change my profile all the time. Sometimes I've got Philip Calvert keynote speaker. Sometimes I've got Philip Calvert LinkedIn trainer. Then I'll go for another day where I take it out. It just horses for courses. Now, then we move down the profile and we've got this bit, yeah? It shows where we're working and where we used to work. At least that's what everybody thinks it's for. It can be what we're doing, not where we're working. Let me give you an example. So this is what I am doing for a living but I've also got an entry in there that says October 2017 the shortest period I can put on there is one month it was actually for one hour I spoke to 4,000 financial advisors in Johannesburg for one and a half hours I spoke to tourism professionals in India so I'm putting this in as if this is a job for one hour, I spoke on social media to Volvo, one hour to Maserati, one hour to Santander. Now, I'm not going to put every client. I'm just going to put the juicy ones in there. Otherwise, it just gets tedious. But what I'm doing on there is to give people a flavour of the kind of people I work with. So if you're a financial advisor, and let's say, and you've got a section that says Smith & Co. Uh, in central Birmingham, that's what you do, fine. But maybe you're also running some seminars around the East Midlands. You could also add that into the experience section and say financial doing equity release seminars around the East Midlands. For one month you did that. Okay, contact details. Now, interesting one, they let you put up to three websites. So maybe you've got a website, uh, you guys we were talking about earlier, maybe you've got a website for wills, you've got a website for financial advice, maybe you've got a separate website for something else. Maybe you've got a blog on another, you could put three separate things. But the, that's all very well, but what I want to show you is this bit here. In the edit section, when you type in your website address, they give you some choices. And the choices are company website, blog, something else, and other. If you choose other, it then opens this box up and gives you an opportunity to get some keywords in. Go back here, there's my website, book me to speak at your event. Two keywords, 
Proven online marketing tools, LinkedIn cheat sheet. I can only do that because I've chosen other in that section there. So I'm getting keywords in as often as I possibly can. Birthdays. Uh, why do you think it's a good idea to put your birthday on your LinkedIn profile? Absolutely. Now, I'm, it's not that just you want loads of birthday cards, um, but it's an opportunity to start a conversation with people. This is the key bit. So last birthday last year, I had 492 people send me happy birthday. 99% of them just hit the button that says, wish Phil happy birthday. Most of them didn't personalize it. But I replied to each and every one of them as if they had personalized it. Hi, Sue. Great to hear from you. Thanks for your good wishes. What's going on in your business right now? So start to see, we, it's an opportunity to get these questions in there again. Is there anyone I can connect you to who could help you with stuff that's going on in your business? Now, I used a bit of copy and paste, but I put, I put their names in every single one of them. And the great thing about the birthdays is people sent me wishes like, oh, I completely forgot about you. You asked me to put a proposal in a month ago and I forgot to do it, you know? this kind of stuff. So it's an opportunity to keep those relationship plates spinning and have conversations with people and get people into coffee shops. You want to be proud of your LinkedIn profile and LinkedIn wants you to promote your LinkedIn profile. So you can actually get a little badge. Uh, if you go to this page here, again, give me a card and I'll, you can go look at this slowly and they give you badges that you can put on your website that say, visit our LinkedIn profile. So where I'm starting to go with this is we want to start looking at our LinkedIn profile as an asset of our business, just like our website is an asset of our business. Be proud of it. Uh, you can put these in your email signature here, and look, they give you the code to do that. Now, if you can't do that, your kids will do it for you. Don't worry about that. So we're do, we're getting up, we've done our keywords thing. People are searching, and we're coming up. Now, maybe I'm looking for a financial planner, and I've done my search. And if I want, I can be fancy and I can, I can filter it by location and so on and so forth. And I want a financial planner and out of everybody who's come up in the search results, I'm gonna, I think Tom's the man for me. So I'm looking at Tom's LinkedIn profile. Now this is a screenshot of Tom's LinkedIn profile, but I've blanked something out. Can anybody tell me what I've blanked off it? Okay, I'll help you. Down the right hand side of Tom's profile is a list of who? His competitors. Do you think Tom wants a list of his competitors on his own LinkedIn profile? And that's what's happening for most of you. And here's the thing. Someone may have recommended Tom to me at a dinner party. And I thought, I'm going to be smart. I'm not going to go to Google. I'll go to LinkedIn. But I'm still being distracted. Tina's his boss. But I'm looking down this list. Oh, look, Adam, he's got letters after his name. And he's a chartered financial planner. Is Tom a chartered financial No, he's not. So maybe Adam's going to get my attention and Tom's not. So the good news is you can switch that off. There's a, in the profile settings, there's the ability to switch off that list so that other people can't see it. And most people don't know that even exists. OK, let's talk about photos. So here's Caroline. She's a financial advisor. She's uploaded a new photo uh, to her profile on LinkedIn. Her network uh, doesn't get to hear about it anymore. But if I see that in her feed, I've got an opportunity to do something. And I can do something as simple as that. Now, what happens, do you suppose, when I put great photo Caroline on Caroline's post here? She might block me. That's entirely... <laughs> fortunately, I know Caroline quite well. I've got, I've got a, a, a lady friend who sends me um, all the messages that guys, when they step way over the line, it's horrific. Anyway, now, so great photo, Caroline. I know Caroline. Hopefully Caroline's going to... Just, just enough to remind her, oh, Phil, how are you? Because we know each other quite well, and it's just a nice... Thing to do but I've got another plan up my sleeve just by me doing that will get the attention of some of Caroline's connections and some of Caroline's connections will go who's this Phil Calvert guy and they go look at my profile and I reel them in and I'll show you how I reel them in soon so that's a nice thing to do okay there's a line you don't cross 
but it's what I'm trying to do is get a conversation going. I just want Caroline to respond, hopefully. I go, how's it going, Caroline? What's going on in your business? Is there anyone I can connect you to that could help you in some way, shape or form? If you don't have a photo, you might as well not be on, and they've done all sorts of research to say, no photo, nobody ever looks at you, okay? So you need to have a photo. Now, there's photos and there's photos. Broadly speaking, that's what we're looking for, but there's a bit more to it than that. So here's Emma. What do you think of Emma's LinkedIn profile photo? It's not ideal, is it? Now, Emma's a lovely lady, but I can't see the whites of her eyes at all. And I know what one or two of you are thinking. Uh. Is she wearing any clothes? That's what. Adam, on the other hand, will make allowances for the projector. In, that's today's much more relaxed office environment, yeah? That's what I would describe as certainly friendly, professional in his marketplace. Now, here's an interesting thing that human beings do when they see people's photos on social media. Regardless of your gender or their gender, if we're interested in something, in somebody, we click on their photo to, so it gets bigger. Now, LinkedIn profile photos are round at the moment, but what you can now do, um, LinkedIn know that people click on profile photos. So what you can do now is you can go back and you can add in a photo which is quite a large file size. You can go up to about four megabytes so that when people do click on it, they get a really nice quality picture like that. Now, so what do we think of Andy's LinkedIn profile? It's not happening, is it? Bart? <laughs> Financial advisor. No. So I'm thinking, oh, maybe she collects reptiles. I look down her profile, nothing to explain that. Financial advisor. Now, some of you are thinking, that's a financial advisor. No way he's going to do my equity release. On the other side of the coin, such as the nature of the internet, some people say, if that's a financial advisor, he's my man. Because I don't want to talk to someone wearing a suit or a tie or whatever. There's a perception about financial advisors, yeah? So for some people, they'll go, like my mother-in-law did. I like the look of him. Head of distribution at AXA, for crying out loud. <laughs> So I'm doing a talk in London to all the big providers. There's like a thousand people in this, this conference. And I put this slide up on the screen. Suddenly there's a load of laughter from the back of the room. Turns out Frank is in the room, sitting at the back on the table. And all his colleagues go, is that really your profile? And he goes like that. And anyway, there's a good old laugh. I finished my presentation. And out the corner of my eye, when I'm packing up, I could see him, see Frank coming up through the crowd towards where I'm in trouble now. Uh, anyway, he comes up to me and says, Phil, Thank you so much for showing my profile picture in your presentation. Then he says, I've got another one of me wearing a Spider-Man outfit. <laughs> and I realised he was actually asking me which of the two did I think was... <laughs> Somehow I don't think that's Vince. Ed, on the other hand, he's the art of financial advisors. He likes to laugh, people know him, so he can get away with this stuff and he changes his profile photo from time to time. That's not a financial advisor, but it's a real LinkedIn uh, profile photo. <laughs> He's on there as well. I love it when I find these. But I thought, let's just see how this guy is presenting himself. You know you can join groups on LinkedIn? So I thought, has he joined any groups? Sure enough. There's a group for everyone. If your target market is craftspeople, people who make wooden toys, rocking horses, stuff like that, they'll be in a group on LinkedIn. On LinkedIn, I found the other day a group for people who manufacture garage doors. That's niche. But if that's your market, they're waiting for you. Possibly a bit unsubtle. Now, here's another one. Now, family offices are supposed to be the pinnacle of personalised financial planning. And look how we're presenting ourselves here and a few other LinkedIn profile photos that I see people using. Mortgage advisor, mortgage advisor. Now, so, if we do have a photo that's a bit different from everybody else's, good. We're differentiating ourselves. This guy here, he runs a Lexus dealership in central London. 
His passion in life is climbing, mountaineering, hiking, and the outdoor life. Okay, that's his thing. And his whole profile tells about mountains that he's climbed, great hikes that he's done out in uh, Colorado, stuff like that, and so that is his profile. He only needs one person who wants to buy a Lexus, or a fleet of Lexuses, who also likes the outdoor life and climbing and hiking, they ain't gonna go to anybody else because they've got something in common. So we need to learn from the people who know what they're talking about. This is Jeff, the boss at LinkedIn, friendly and professional. Dara, CEO at Uber, friendly and professional. Melanie at Google, friendly and professional. <laughs> Some guy I found in Buckinghamshire. Okay, you also need to have a real photo. So many people don't put a picture that's actually them. They put someone that maybe is a stylized version. I first saw that photo and I thought, it's just something about that picture doesn't quite ring true. So do you know how to find out whether it's a real photo or not? This is potentially useless if someone, useful if someone's applying for a job in your business. You can check, is that really them? So what you do if you're using Google Chrome is you right click on the picture and it says search by image. Google does a search and it finds everywhere else that that same picture is being used on the internet. And sure enough, it is a stock photo that people can buy and use in adverts. I did it with Caroline, I mean, I know it's Caroline, but it showed me that she's using the same picture on Twitter, same picture on Google. But here's the thing again about differentiation. This is a real profile photo. I right clicked on him and it showed me all of these, apart from the fact that he's in there, Mr. Miliband, it says we've got this uniform thing so we struggle to stand out from the crowd. And I'm not suggesting we need to wear flashing, spinning bow ties or anything wacky like that. That's circus poster territory. But I'm suggesting we just need to be kind of conscious of this stuff. So friendly and professional is good. Real is good. And we probably want to try and look competent and confident as well. But what's interesting is my psychology friends is when we look at people's profile photos, we're not actually looking for any of that at all. We're looking for that. Do we look trustworthy? It is believed the only reason we shake hands with when we meet someone is to prove that we're not concealing a weapon. And it's stayed with us for millennia. So we want to try and look trustworthy in our photos. Now, how we do that, I have no idea at all. Um, but it's something to bear in mind. OK, media means pictures. And here they go down here. You need, because some people like to read stuff on your profile, some people like to look at stuff on your profile. Now, uh, you, so you can add all sorts of things, presentations, videos, infographics, spreadsheets if you must, PDF downloads, you name it, you can stick it on your LinkedIn profile. And it's a good thing that you do do that because LinkedIn gives you some numbers. Now, when this feature first came in where you could add media to your thing, uh, I added those pictures there and that happened to my profile views instant big jump in profile views. So any of these things that you could, you could put on your LinkedIn profile, infographics like I mentioned earlier. And when you think about it, financial advice, it, it's a tad dry, arguably. If there's any way we can sex it up a bit, um, then all the best, yeah, all the better. Now there is a website out there called SlideShare. Anyone heard of SlideShare? Okay, SlideShare is like YouTube, but just for PowerPoint presentations. How cool is that? Just go on there and just wade through PowerPoint presentations. But SlideShare is owned by LinkedIn. So if you upload a presentation to SlideShare, it automatically appears on your LinkedIn profile as well. But it's what you could do with it. Um, here's Tina, financial advisor in North London. She has created a PowerPoint presentation that is only designed to be read by viewers of her LinkedIn profile. Thanks for visiting us on LinkedIn today. So it's, the whole thing is aimed at LinkedIn people. Um, and you, you know, there's all kind of, you've probably all got a presentation hidden away somewhere. Repurpose it, bring it up to date, put it on your LinkedIn profile. Uh, I use, I've got 27 presentations on SlideShare. I mean, I could take this presentation today and upload it to SlideShare tonight. But every now and again, they send you some numbers and I'll take 28,000 views any day. Thank you very much. Okay. Up the top of your LinkedIn profile, we have this massive great space here, which hardly any financial advisors use it. It's free, you don't have to pay LinkedIn to use this, but if I profess to be a speaker, I'm gonna have a dirty great big picture of me speaking. 
And what you can also do, you can overlay some text as well. However you want to do it, it's up to you. Down in Cornwall is a financial advisor called Pete Matthew, who does YouTube videos, and he's got a very, very popular podcast. So he's using the big space at the top to show him recording his podcast, a still from one of his videos that he does as well. So be creative as to how you use that. Now, um, another great way to upload pictures to your LinkedIn profile is through the mobile app. LinkedIn's put a lot of effort into the mobile app, so they reward you when you use it. So uh, when I was speaking in India, um, I don't know if any of you have ever been to a conference in India, there's no such thing as a one-day conference in India. They're always two days minimum, because the first day is always ceremony, drums, food eating, press, VIP. The whole day is like ceremony. And if it's a big conference, they quite often bring some elephants along outside as well. And if an elephant comes along, you've got to have a selfie, haven't you? So I took this picture outside the conference hall in India, uploaded it to LinkedIn as a status update, but I got my keywords in there. I said, I'm speaking here in India to tourism professionals on how to use LinkedIn. This really is an event organiser, so I'm sitting here at a meeting with another speaker, meeting this event professional here in London today, and here's a conference I was at and I did exactly the same thing. Upload pictures, and what I've really just done there is told little stories. Literally a one-line story attached to a photo. How hard is that to do? Okay, then we have the um, About Us section. And a good way to go is just bullet points. Unless you are a professional copywriter, just bullet point your, what, what it is you want to say. Particularly for the sort of first paragraph or so. Uh, this guy, look, he's really gone to town on bullet points. Straight to the point. Tina, financial advisor in North London. Now, she's not gone for the bullet points thing, but I know her game, so I'm going to turn my forensic torch onto her profile, and what do I find? Keywords. I mean, the first paragraph alone. Keyword, 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 keyword. First paragraph is really, really important, because when Google comes along to uh, look at your profile, it reads the name, headline, and first paragraph of your summary section. So Google doesn't get down here, just gets to about there. So make sure your, one of your or two of your top five keywords are in that first paragraph. OK, before we break for tea, I just want to quickly cover something um, that is a growing trend in business and society. And that is to show off what you care about and what volunteer work you do. Um, it's one of the things I tell the kids when they're doing their Duke of Edinburgh's award, that's a great thing to put on their LinkedIn profile, but as part of the Duke of Edinburgh award, even at the bronze level, they've got to do some volunteer work because recruiters consider volunteer work as important and as valuable as paid work. But more and more of us these days will purchase products and services based on our perception of what they care about, their ethical credentials, their environmental credentials. If you care about the environment, chances are you'll want to use products and service providers who also care about the environment. There's a space for you to do that on your LinkedIn profile. In fact, all these different areas, you can list those out on your LinkedIn profile. If you can get a keyword in there as well, all the better. Martin Bamford, he really goes for local. So a director of Park Run in Cranley, he does the Cranley and Bloom flower thing, and he's on Cranley Chamber of Commerce. So he, although he's the top financial advisor on how to use the internet, he knows that local, old school stuff is really, really important. And LinkedIn's got a whole separate website where you can learn more about this, where you can volunteer as a mentor and all kinds of stuff. It looks great on your profile. So when you get the slides, go visit that and learn more about it. Uh, here's a, here's a, a minor point, but it's really important to, uh, to some people, depending on the market that you look after. Uh, I mentioned Tina again, uh, Serenity Financial Planning. Tina's Greek. Now, she lives in North London, where there's a largest Greek community, and she's got some Greek clients. And she figures that she might want to attract some more Greek clients. So what you can do is you can write to LinkedIn Help and say, can I have another LinkedIn profile, which I just write in Greek, um, which could be quite useful. So if you service a, a client bank or a particular target market that speak another language, uh, then you could do that as well. I mean, this guy here is just, just showing off, to be quite honest. And that's his LinkedIn profile photo as well. 
Okay, skills section. Now, this is really good. The skills section is not uh, testimonials. It's a kind of quick and dirty way for people to endorse you for a skill. And it's also a quick and dirty way for people to get a sense of the level of expertise that you have in a given area. So you can list about 50 skills uh, if you want to. Um, ideally, try and get a couple of keywords into your uh, skills list as well. And said people can endorse you. You can have skills, your top skills, industry skills, tech that you do, interpersonal, and anything else. I mean, one of my other skills is I make a killer gin and tonic. In fact, I make the best gin and tonic in the world, officially. Yes. A gentleman called John Tankery <laughs> taught me how to do it. Anyway, uh, but I put it in there and occasionally people sending me messages on LinkedIn and says, tell me the secret message to the secret recipe. <laughs> I'm not telling you now. I've just literally, I, yesterday I finished writing the book on how to, it's really short and it's going to be on Kindle over the next few days. So if you're interested, uh, go, look, go, for, go look for that. Anyway, so skills. So I can list out a whole bunch of skills. People can endorse them. It, it was a bit clunky when it was first introduced. But anybody could endorse anybody for anything. Uh, day one, I got three people endorse me for pottery. <laughs> Not a skill I was aware of, OK? So you list out your skills. And what you can also do is you can choose one of the skills. And then you can see who actually endorsed you. Now, now that I know who endorsed me for these things, what would be a good thing for me to do? That's really interesting. So why do 99.99% .99 of people on LinkedIn never say thank you when someone endorses them? Why do 99.99% .99 of people on LinkedIn never say thank you when people look at their profile? We all know it's the right thing to do. No one does it. Guess what happens when you say thank you to someone? A conversation starts going. Recommendations. It's another opportunity to say how things are going in your business. Is there any help that you need at the moment? Can I introduce you to anyone? So let's look at art skills. <laughs> what I love is that 17 people have actually endorsed. <laughs> He's got another one down here that says, I can tell the difference between margarine and butter. Uh, so you can see clearly that's what his number one skill is, yeah? This is what this is all about. OK, have we won any prizes? Have we won any awards? Have we done anything special? Let's go back to Martin. This is one of these kind of hidden sections on the LinkedIn profile. You need to dig deep to even find it. But there's a thing called certification. So that's, you know, all the stuff you've done, your exams, any prizes that you've won in the industry or, or, or elsewhere, for that matter. Publications, Martin's written, I think he's written about five books now after those initial three I showed you this morning. He's done a course that looks a bit ordinary, but project. I wonder what that is. For Martin, writing a book isn't good enough. He decides to make his own movie. And one, one January the 1st, he said, right, this year I'm going to make, make my own movie. He goes on to Google how to make a movie, figured out he could do that, how hard could it be? And he decides to make a movie, it was like a documentary, about the fossil finance needs of the baby boom generation. It was premiered at the IFP, the Institute of Financial Planning Conference. Um, I mean, that's one notch above writing a book, isn't it? Uh, that adds something to your credibility. But he did it because you can. I'll jump over that one. OK, so profile is set up. Now what do we do? So we've done all the hard work. Now, in theory, the easy bit happens. But we've got to actually do it. Having the best profile in the world, having 100 people a day looking at your profile, it's all very good. But if we don't take the next step, it's still a waste of time. So for most financial advisors, you want to focus on getting profile views. And you have to remember, no one ever visits your profile by accident. Everybody does it on purpose. Some people use uh, tools, automation tools, to, to visit your profile. But LinkedIn clamp, clamping down on that very, very hard. If anyone ever tries to sell you a package where they can uh, do the work for you, lead generation on LinkedIn, they will be using one of these tools. And you will get blocked by LinkedIn if you do that. So these are all the things that you could do on LinkedIn that could result in someone looking at your profile. When you get the slides, you might want to print this one off and just kind of use it as an aid memoir. Any of these things here could result in someone looking at your profile. So we want to do more of these things. So let me ask you a question. 
would you like to know the names and addresses of everyone who looks at your website? You find that useful? Would that be useful? Of course it would. Now, I can't give you that. There's a lot of information I can give you about your website, but I can give you the next best thing. LinkedIn gives you some very, very interesting data, and it probably, the data is there all the time. It's on your profile. No one else can see it except for you. But on a Monday, they update the numbers. And the numbers they give you relate to how many viewed your profile, what they do, where they work, what they searched for, who looked at your profile, and also who followed you. They are actually telling you who deliberately looked at your profile. Now that surely is a useful thing to know. I just took a screenshot, one of mine, uh, that particular week, 583 searches I came up, so good. These were some of the companies that were looking at me. These were some of the search terms they typed into the search box. This is what they do. And they give me some graphs, and I look at my graph, uh, and uh, that I'm interested in. My head's thinking, what did I do last week that resulted in that increase? Did I post more? Was I more visible? Did I interact with people more? In fact, on an old version of LinkedIn, they actually told you what you did. Added connections, endorsed people, joined a group. Uh, that feature isn't there at the moment, but they will bring it back. But after a while, you'll start to get a sense of what it is that you are doing that's influencing your numbers up and down. That's a useful thing to know. So, another bit of data they give you. It tells me, in the last three days, I've shown up in search results 70 times. Now, I'm really pleased about that. It tells me that I'm getting my keyword strategy kind of right. But what is more important to me is that this number of people actually viewed my profile. And I can see who viewed my profile. Now that I know who viewed my profile, what do you think I ought to do next? Say thanks. Most people don't ever bother to do that. They did it on purpose. Now let's just imagine for a moment that you run a little florist in the centre of uh, Reading. Okay, lovely little shop you've got there. On a Saturday morning, front door opens, the little bell rings, you see the customer walking in and you do this. You hide. And they notice you do that. How are they going to feel? Well, that's exactly what we all do on LinkedIn. People walk into our shop and we ignore them. Daft, isn't it? So we say thank you, but there's a right way and there's a wrong way to say thank you. And this is the single most valuable feature on LinkedIn, the ability to be able to see who looks at our profile and then engage back with them. Now, on the free version of LinkedIn, you can see the last five people who looked at your profile. So if you log in every day, you'll probably stay way up, up to date with the complete list. But if you pay even the cheapest version of premium, you can get to see the last 90 days worth of people look at your profile. And that is absolutely, that's gold sitting there, just waiting for you to pick it up. So why should you say thank you to people? So an event planner looked at my profile. I said, thanks for looking at my profile today. I hope you found something of interest. Um, and I sent it as a connection request, I think. And this is what they replied. job done. I'll bet they looked for several other speakers. I'll bet you that I was the only one who said, thanks for looking at my profile. In fact, I'll guarantee that because nobody does it. And just to give you some, what you should do is whip through the list of people. Now, you don't have to say thank you to everybody because you'd be there all day saying thank you to people. Okay. But what you should do is have a quick look through and try and guess in your head why have they looked at my profile. So let's have a look. Jeffrey works at Mercedes-Benz Financial, so I'm definitely going to say thanks to Jeffrey. Provider, I like a face, to be honest. Employee benefits consultant, so that's financial services, I'm definitely going to say thanks. Madonna, uh, can't see any connection, not for now. Photographer, not interested. Financial service, definitely going to say thank you. Some more, nope. This guy's kind of flogged me something. Janice is a personal friend. Fernando, not interested. Diageo, they make Gordon's gin. Could be a useful connection. Mike, now you can see some of them I'm not connected to. Mike's just had, a, had another look. But I'm definitely going to say thanks. How are things going, Mike? 
that sort of thing, yeah? And this is how we say thank you to people. Usually, you send it as a connection request, and this is what you say. Now, on the surface, that looks like the most bland of messages imaginable, but there's quite a lot of subtlety going on in there. First of all, you use their name. From today, never ever send another connection request to anyone on LinkedIn without personalising it with their name. Don't just hit the connect button, yeah? Send a message with it. And I put their name and I put three dots. Why do you think I put three dots afterwards? Yeah, it's a copywriting technique that encourages people to keep reading because there's obviously some more, yeah? Thanks for taking a look at my profile. I hope you found something of interest. I might put a question mark on the end. Then I go for something that, that this is what works. I notice we've mutual connections and if you know where they are, say it. Find something that you've got something in common. It could be you're in the same town, but it will usually be that you've got some mutual connections. Doesn't matter who they are, just highlight that fact. Thanks in advance, dot, dot, dot. The words thanks in advance with three dots after it are proven to dramatically increase the likelihood that people will respond to your message. Proven over and over again. Stick it in your emails as well. People reply faster. Thanks in advance. It's that simple. And I'll show you another version of this in a moment too. People can also, uh, oh, this is where you say thank you. So you see this? You've probably seen that on LinkedIn. Okay. Never, ever, ever click that button there. Bad stuff happens. Never click the connect button on that page because that will just send the automated message and you can't. So what you should do is go into their profile, have a look around, and then use the connection button that is on their profile. Then you can personalize the message. You can also thank people who follow you, so people don't necessarily have to connect with you on LinkedIn, they can just follow your stuff. So do exactly the same thing. Click Manage Followers and have a look and see what they're doing. Let me just jump over. So let's start. How do we create conversations with people? I've got what I call a keep in touch strategy. The birthday thing is, is a perfect example of that. I'm just looking for any opportunity to keep the relationship plates spinning. It's the online equivalent of going and have a beer to catch up with people, okay? Uh, and the way I can do that is any of this stuff here. So again, when you get the slides, you might want to print this one off. Do any of these things here, you'll get their attention. And the opportunity to have a conversation starts. You can now, instead of sending a normal message through LinkedIn, you can send voice messages. You can only do it on the, uh, on the mobile app. Um, and when you receive a voice message, my goodness, does it stand out from the crowd. Somebody sends you a voice message, it adds a human element to it. The tone of the message is much more informal than how people write to you. So consider sending voice messages to people on LinkedIn instead. One or two people can send video messages as well. They're starting to roll that one out as well. Okay, let's look at a few scripts. So we've seen one script. Someone looked to my profile and that's why I send them. Let's look at another version of this. Hi Sue, yes, I'm happy to connect. Thank you. Let me know if I can connect you to anyone on my network. Can I ask what prompted you to say hello? Thanks in advance. Again, it looks simple, but there's a lot going on in there. So, Sue has asked to connect with me. She didn't personalise the message, but I've replied as if she had. I've replied as if she said, Phil, please may I connect with you? So I've answered using one of the most powerful words in the English language. I've planted the word yes into her head which makes her much, much more likely to give me her attention, to listen to what I might have to say. Uh, and I've been doing a little speaker's trick on all of you today. I've been planting the word yes into your head. Have you noticed? Occasionally I've said, uh, how you, are you finding this useful? And I've nodded my head and you all nodded along with me. So if I've got a pile of books to sell at the back of the room today, you've probably all been to conferences where the speaker's got books to sell. So what we do, so we've got our books at the back of the room and throughout the whole presentation we get you nodding your head, getting you saying yes. And at the very end of the presentation you might say something like, if you would like to buy my book, they're at the back and almost every one of you will buy my book. So you get people thinking and saying the word yes. So you plant it in a message here. I'm happy to connect, thank you. Now, then 
I use the power of reciprocity. And here's that question again. Please let me know if I can connect you to anyone in my network. What I don't say is, hi Sue, thanks for looking at my profile, thanks for the connection request. Are you looking for a speaker for your next event? I don't do that. That's called sales. What I do is the complete opposite. And I offer her something potentially of very high value. I've offered a give. Most people never take me up on that. But subconsciously, she really appreciates that offer. And it's using that third question that I mentioned this morning. Then I say, can I ask what prompted you to say thanks in advance? Almost everyone replies to that message. Here's another one. Hi, Michael. Yes, happy to connect. Thank you. I see you're a financial planner, assuming they are. Then I use social proof. Now, this is astonishingly powerful. The majority of my financial services connections have joined my private forum. Over 1,500 of them use it to share useful resources and to make value. You should join us. Financial planners are joining here. This is my group. In other words, remember I was saying earlier about getting them onto my value ladder, getting them off LinkedIn and on my value This is what I'm doing. Now, let's just talk about this. It's staggeringly powerful. There's a book called Yes by Robert Cialdini. Okay, he's a psychologist. Um, and he talks about, in his book, yes, he talks about the six universal laws of human influence. Reciprocity is one of them. I give you something, it makes it much more likely you'll give me something back, even if it's just your attention. But one of them is social proof. The power of using human behaviour to make people act in a certain way. So, for example, if we went outside the front door of the hotel right now, and we're still on the step and we went, it's not going to be very long until anybody in that vicinity We'll start doing this as well. We copy each other, right? Um, in Cranley, where I live, there's a, there's a bit of pavement, which is quite thin, and it's got a, so a big metal bollard in the middle from when there was a coaching inn. And on Saturday morning, I do this every... It's really sad, I know. I do this every Saturday morning. I walk down this pavement, OK? And then one day, I'll walk this way around the bollard, and I'll carry on. I look over my shoulder. Everyone behind me walks that way around the bollard. OK? If I do it again, and this time I go this way around the bollard, look over my shoulder, everyone behind me goes that way around the bollard. Humans copy each other. Uh, in hotels, there'll be one in this hotel here. You know when you're going to st you stay in a hotel in the bathroom, there's usually like a little sign that says, we're trying to save the environment, can you use your towels more than once? They've discovered there's a certain compliance rate with that. But they found if you change the words to imply that everyone else uses their towels more than once, the compliance rate shoots up. And they change it to something like, the majority of people who stay in this hotel use their towels more than once. Compliance rate goes up by 70%. They then found you can improve it even further when you personalise it. And they put, the majority of people stay in this room, 202, use their towels more than once. Compliance rate goes up even further. Um, my grandmother, uh, the wife of the inventor, uh, she used to, while he was in his lab doing stuff, uh, she used to travel the world. She particularly loved Greece. She particularly loved Athens. She particularly loved the Acropolis. And she used to bring most of it home with her. Loose bit of marble sticking out of the ground. I'll have that. Thank you very much. In the bag it goes. It wasn't just her. Everybody did, used to do it. It used to be a big problem. And the Greek authorities in, about the, in the 60s started putting up signs that saying, please do not remove any loose objects. Guess what happened when they put signs up? more people wanted and started nicking stuff. And that's a weird thing about humans. That sign says other people are removing stuff. And even if we shouldn't, that is enough to suggest, well, I ought to as well. Social proof. So what I do here is I tell my financial advisor connections, well, everyone else has joined my group. And I get almost a 100% success rate with that message there. Look, here's the proof. There's the link, that's where they're joining. So, if we're using LinkedIn as a lead generation tool, this is one of the ways you could do it. So, to use the, the, the silly example of the recruiters who approach you, you could say, the majority of recruiters who visit my profile download my free guide, how recruiters can increase their income by, get them off LinkedIn or get a conversation going. Use social proof. That book is amazing, it's just called Yes. Oh, and then, uh, maybe you've spotted something else. Uh, I spotted on LinkedIn, notice, we have a mutual interest in yoga. How often do you practice? That's on the assumption that they do. Uh, but this is a good word as well. I spotted you. 
that suggests to them that they did something that you noticed. And when they accept the request, we've got a few choices. Thanks for connecting, I appreciate your interest. And then I repeat this one. If I can connect you to any of my network, please don't hesitate to ask. Then either I noticed your post about it, it caught my attention, or I see that you're connected to James, or I see you're based in, it'd be great work in there, and this is a good one. I'm doing a bit of research at the moment for a project. What's the biggest issue that financial planners are struggling with right now? If you do mortgages for surgeons, you could say, I'm doing a bit of research at the moment for a project. What's the biggest issue that surgeons are facing around purchasing property? Whatever. Now, so those are scripts that already work. Now we can make them work even better. There is a piece of software called Crystal Nose. It's artificial intelligence. You plug it into your LinkedIn profile. You plug it into your email system. And when you start writing a message, it tells you which words you should leave out and which other words you should add in. It runs a sort of profile assessment. And, it, and some, if you plug it into your email, I've sent messages to people and I've started typing it in. It suddenly flashed up and says, don't use that. Get to the point. Don't faff around with this person. Or this person likes a bit more of a lead in before you get to the point. And it's free, by the way, as well. We all like free, don't we? Yeah, I did it again. See, he said yes. <laughs> OK, status updates and posts. Um, so let's just think about how this works. The way the algorithm works, let's say for sake of argument, you've got 100 connections on LinkedIn. You put a status update onto LinkedIn, you'd be forgiven for thinking that all 100 of those people will see that post. Not going to happen. Five might see it if you're lucky. But what the algorithm is looking for is some kind of reaction to your post. If one person likes it or comments on it or something like that, then LinkedIn shows it to a few more people. And if a few of them like it, they show it to a few more. It's exactly the same on Facebook. In fact, it's even worse on Facebook particularly if you've got a Facebook business page. If you've got 100 followers of your Facebook page and you put a piece of content on it, they might show it to three. What they want you to do is get your wallet out. That's fair enough. So this is how the algorithm... So what we've got to do with LinkedIn is post content that the algorithm thinks is going to be a post content that was going to get other human beings to react. So right now, you post anything about Brexit, your post will be seen by thousands of people because people react positively, negatively, all that stuff, but you know, you're not going to post about that. Um, I'm just going to jump over a few here to make a point. So the best type of status updates on LinkedIn tell stories. The, most, the best status update I've ever put on LinkedIn was when I was going off to speak in uh, Bulgaria and I'd forgotten to book my parking at Gatwick Airport. And I'd got limited time, I had to go to the post office, I'd go and get a haircut. But before I did that, I went onto the Gatwick parking website, put my details in and it said 53 quid for two, three days, whatever. I thought, right, okay, I'll now go down to the post office, did my thing, came back, booked the parking. It had gone up to 75 quid. And that was my status update on LinkedIn. Hashtag should have booked it earlier or something like that. I didn't need to put a photo of Gatwick parking. I just needed to tell a little human story. Things that we do every single day. Now what this means is you've got to start turning on, and bloggers do this, start turning on this little radar inside your head that looks for stuff that happens in your day-to-day -day life. Just tell short little stories that impact human beings. And I had thousands and thousands of likes, loads of people telling me I should have booked it the first. I mean, I know that. But I knew it was a story that everybody could resonate with. Nostalgia is a great thing to do. Do you remember the Coca-Cola adverts at Christmas? We all remember those, don't we? It's nostalgia. Humans love that. Um, that uh, it's stuff that gets people in here is what works. Now, you might think, well, that's for Facebook, really but there's no reason why you can't do it on LinkedIn as well. I'll give you some examples in a second. So tell stories. Don't put pictures in your status updates if you're using a desktop or a laptop. LinkedIn penalizes your post because the pictures take up too much space in the newsfeed. But you can 
post pictures using the mobile app. And LinkedIn rewards you because they want you to use the mobile app. Don't put links in your post. The worst kind of status updates posts on LinkedIn are, check out our latest blog, click here. That hasn't got hope in hell's chance of being seen because you are proactively encouraging people to leave LinkedIn. They don't want you doing that, yeah? Put a link to your company page maybe or somewhere else on LinkedIn, but don't encourage people to leave LinkedIn. Just tell stories with no links. If you must put a link in, it's critical that you do, put it in the first comment below. Or another trick is to post your thing without the link, put it live, then hit the edit button, then put the link in and post it live again. You trick the algorithm into thinking there's no link in your post. Comment on other people's stuff, use your hashtags, but LinkedIn loves video. They want you to put video on the site now and they're right now in the process of rolling out live video as well. So just like you can do on Facebook, you can do live video on there as well. LinkedIn wants you to use its, its toys. When you use the toys, they give you more visibility. They've recently upgraded company pages on LinkedIn and they want you to use them. So if you, use, if you post status updates on your company page, they will get more visibility than they might otherwise have done because LinkedIn is rewarding you for doing that. You can post articles on LinkedIn. It used to be absolutely brilliant, but now they're taking the same approach as Google. Any articles that you post on LinkedIn have got to be ultra high quality. They need to be long, detailed, research-based with your own take on it, your own unique take on it. Um, so we're talking really high quality, which for most of us, we haven't got the time to do that stuff. But if article marketing is your thing and you love writing, then use the article tool on LinkedIn. Um, and, you know, let's be honest about this. Let's go for the jugular. This is one I saw on LinkedIn about never giving up. Anyway, tens of thousands of views, a um, few trolls coming out, so this isn't appropriate for LinkedIn. Yes, it is. Let's get over ourselves. And sure, cats and kittens playing around in boxes probably ain't going to work, you know, but somebody made that as a lesson on leader, on leadership, on uh, lesson on never giving up, you know. Uh, this stuff works. That, why does that work? Because it gets you in there. It's human. That's what it's about. Now, if you must put pictures, I said don't put pictures, but if you must, let's just go for the jugular, yeah? First day at work for Magnus, our new office dog. 227 people got nothing better to do with their time than to comment on that. Job done for Max there, yeah? Nick runs a Bentley dealership. You can only use three words to describe your thoughts on this. A green Bentley. 1,300 comments. Human stuff, yeah? <clears throat> this one, you might even have seen this one. Uh, Emily, HR manager, Asda. This is Patrick, he's 86, stopped me in Leeds, asked me how my day was and said, uh, had, he, had she got time for a coffee? Meeting's cancelled, two hours with this most wonderful man. 11,000 comments. Now, I would imagine that Asda got some fairly tight social media policies. Maybe she broke a few there. I don't think anyone's gonna sack her for that. Human stuff, this is what it's all about. And we've got it in our head that LinkedIn's a business site, so we need to behave in a business way and put serious stuff, put human stuff. Nostalgia, we talked about 
Now, the hashtag, this is, this is uh, fairly new. This is an advanced technique, but my goodness, it's powerful. So we talked about hashtags earlier. What you can now do, if you go onto your LinkedIn uh, home newsfeed, what you'll find is just a bunch of comments, a bu bunch of stuff that is vaguely relevant to you. But maybe, and let's use golf as an example, maybe you don't want all the other businessy stuff, you just want to find stuff related to golf. Maybe professional golfers are your target market, whatever. Go to the LinkedIn search box and you type in hashtag golf, enter. LinkedIn will change the whole of the newsfeed to only show you content related to golf. And if golf's your thing, happy days. Now, the next thing you need to do is you can save that search. So after it says hashtag golf, there'll be a little button that says save. And so you can then rerun that search in future at any time. But what you've also done is you've told LinkedIn that one of your interests is golf. Now, the next thing you need to do is just scroll down the feed and look at the thousands and thousands of posts related to golf and just pick out one or two at random that you find quite interesting or maybe you've got a comment that you could add and you find one that somebody's written uh, about a new type of golf ball or whatever, then you could put interesting posts to, I haven't tried these yet, thanks for the heads up, hashtag golf. And then you scroll down and you look for another post, great post John, have you thought about doing this, hashtag golf. Scroll down, find another one, simple one line comment. So use other people's content to come. Now what you're doing is you're telling LinkedIn, A, you're interested in golf, B, you're interested in other people who are interested in golf, and C, you have added value to the community by engaging with other human beings. What LinkedIn has realized in recent times <coughs> is that social media is just noise. Just people shouting their mouths off, promoting themselves all the time. So what LinkedIn is now doing is trying to go back to the days of social networking. And they will reward LinkedIn users who network with others and who show interest, particularly common interests. So for financial advisors, you could do the same thing. Uh, maybe choose the word pensions, go to the uh, search box, type in hashtag pensions, submit. Newsfeed changes to only show content related to pensions. You click save. So you tell LinkedIn, I'm interested in pensions. You then go down, you'll find a bunch of providers. You'll find a bunch of financial advisors talking about pensions. And you could do exactly the same thing. Interesting post, Sue. Thanks for the heads up. Hashtag pensions. And maybe add two more hashtags. It's up to you. Just find out, find some more content. Interesting one you say there. I hadn't thought of that. Hashtag pensions. Just piggyback on the back of other people's stuff. LinkedIn will reward you and make sure that the posts that you put on and appear much more visible, they're shown to more people, and you will appear higher in the search results. Brand new this, you're one of this lot and from London last week even know about this. Um, and you will find your profile views shoot up as a result simply by engaging with people around a topic of common interest. Now I'm now going to show you how you can use common interest to find clients. So this is Thomas Power, who I mentioned this morning, Alan Sugar's first ever real apprentice. This is the guy who's written eight books about networking. This is the guy who invented profiles on social networking platforms. He was the one that came up with the idea of having a photo, having your name, having a professional headline. And on Academy, which was his site, what the first thing you had, instead of a summary section, you had a list of your personal interests. Dog walking, gin, holidays, this kind of stuff. You listed them out. Now, Thomas teaches networking. And one of the things he does is uh, he'll have a room full of about 50 people and he will show them his, the first ever, his first ever profile. And he lists out his, his interests and he's got running, he's got tennis, uh, and he's got corks in there. Yep, he's one of those saddos who collects corks. When you go to his house, he has a room where you're literally wading through corks. And there's always a few people in the room, God, that is sad, isn't it? He collects corks. But he always turns to the audience and he says, just out of interest, is there anyone else here who collects corks? 
and he finds out of a room full of 50 people, he'll see two who do this. Okay? And everybody tells they collect corks. How sad is that? Then he says, is anyone here who's interested in Manchester United? A few hands go up. Anyone here interested in Black Labradors? A few hands go up. And he carries on. And then there's a coffee break. And at the coffee break, he's pretending to be getting the next section ready, and he looks out the corner of his eye, and he sees a really interesting thing happening. The cork collectors suddenly find themselves coming together at the coffee machine. The Manchester United fans come together in a corner. The people like Black Labradors start coming. Human beings find it irresistible to talk to and engage with other people where they've got a common interest, even if they don't know them from Adam. So, how could we use that to find ourselves a client? Let's go back to Tina. Now, LinkedIn copied this interest thing off Academy. It's not there anymore, but you can still do it. So here's Tina's LinkedIn profile, and she's listed out her personal interests. Yeah, she sneaked in some keywords in there as well. Remember, she's Greek. And I said to Tina, Tina, what's the biggest issue going on in your business right now? Who could I connect you to that could help you out? She said, I need to find another financial planner for my business, but I need someone who gets what we do at Serenity Financial Plan. She said, no recruiter has ever managed to find me the right person. We have a particular style about us. And I said, okay, pick a word in your interest and I'll find you that person. She says, okay, I'll make it hard for you. Let's go for bazooki. You know, the stringed instrument that we hear in Tavernas. So what we do is we click on the word bazooki. This is an old version of LinkedIn. LinkedIn then finds everybody on LinkedIn who's also got bazooki on their profile. Puts Tina at the top of the list and then the algorithm ranks the rest in order of relevance to Tina. And number two, Paul Burns, financial advisor in Cyprus, which just happens to be where Tina was born. Now, you guys have already told me it's a pain in the ass when recruiters approach you. Do you think Paul will find it a pain in the ass if somebody he doesn't know from Adam approaches him and says, would you like to come and work for our firm? Do you think he'd find that a pain in the ass? Of course he would. So Tina doesn't do that. She sends a little message to him. Hi, Paul. I see we've both got bazooki on our profile. How cool is that? Where do you come from? Do you think he's going to answer? Of course he is. That's how you do this. When I'm not doing this, I do a bit of kickboxing. So what I wanted to try and do, let's see if I can use the word kickboxing to get me a speaking opportunity at a bank. Banks are great for speaking opportunities. They've usually got thousands of people in the room. If I get all of them saying yes, they'll buy, they'll buy my book and they pay very well. So let me see if I can get into a bank using the word kickboxing. So I search kickboxing in the LinkedIn search box. It finds me 50,000 people who've got kickboxing on their profile. First few pages are all kickboxing instructors. Don't want one, I've got one. So what I now do is I hit the filters and I bit more, I'll make it hard for myself. Let's just go for London and let's put financial services. LinkedIn redoes the search and it finds me 128 people. And Rui is my way in. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a look at Rui. Now, he will not be guaranteed 100%, he will not be the person who books speakers for their conference. He's a guy who works at Barclays. But we have a look at his profile. It turns out he's quite hardcore. So I'm going to send Rui a message. What's the message I'm going to send him? Am I going to send him the message that says, I'd like to add you to my professional network on LinkedIn? Would that be a good idea? So why does everybody do that? Is that the question I send? I don't send him that. I send him that. <laughs> and down here, all the thanks in advance stuff, yeah? Three days later, we're sitting in a coffee shop in central London. This is how you do it. And I'm not going to say I'm a speaker. We're just, I'm just going to chat about him. What's it like? And we can talk about kickboxing and jujitsu and stuff like that. And I'm just going to wait until the moment comes when he says, so what do you do, Phil? After I've already got in his head, we've got a lot in common, financial services, kickboxing, we're enjoying a coffee. That moment will come when he'll say to me, what do you do, Phil? And he's my way in. I do it with yoga as well. Type yoga into the box, 
657,000 results, filter it to UK, events, services, redo the search, 420 people that I've got something in common with. Isn't that interesting? Event managers and yoga teachers. That's how you do this. People by people. Always have done and always will. Like a bit more? I'm going to skip over groups because uh, company pages are exactly the same as I've already been talking about. Keep it personal. I mean, if you work for a big, big corporation, then fine, people tend to use their, put their numbers and they advertise jobs and stuff like that. It's, it's the way you do. One of the levels of premium, you can get all sorts of insights into the company. Um, but for smaller companies, like all of us, keep it personal. Tell those little stories. Repeat what you put on the main status updates. Use the tools that LinkedIn gives you. And if you do that, they reward you by putting you higher up in the search results. There's also a hidden feature on LinkedIn called Showcase Pages. And the way you can use showcases like this, so Microsoft have a company page on LinkedIn, but they can also have showcase pages that just focus on one of their product. Uh, Ford have a company page, and they've got a showcase page for Ford Italia, and Ford means business. Uh, I've seen one uh, car manufacturer has created a showcase page for each of its car models. You can have up to seven showcase pages on LinkedIn. Company, so you can have a personal page, company page, seven showcase pages. Hidden, <laughs> hidden feature. Mattel, the toy people, have a company page, and their showcase page is Barbie. And they did it in quite a clever way. They made Barbie, they deliberately aimed their showcase page at teenage girls who want to be entrepreneurs. And what you could do is you go in, you can ask Barbie questions, where can I get funding, how do I get a website. And initially there was a lot of controversy around it, but they, people just love it now. Very clever idea. It's important to remember that people on LinkedIn, the overwhelming majority of your, your connections on LinkedIn will never be customers. But if they like your content, they like your posts, it gets them in there, they will refer you. Same way as with company pages. People can follow your company page. They may never become a customer, but they can still be an advocate for your business at that next dinner party. Now, here's a hidden feature as well. One of the things my dad said to me that day, uh, after he said, get yourself a proper job, one of the things he said to me was, do you know, one of the things that you'll find really valuable as you go through your career is your network. Look after your network, and they will look after you. His actual words were, uh, look after your old boy's network, which is not an <laughs> expression we probably use too much these days, but we get what he meant. And I had no idea what he meant by a network. No idea at all, but he gave me this piece of parting advice. I stumbled by accident a few years ago on a section of LinkedIn that creates, if you like, company pages for schools and universities. So Oxford University has got its own page. If you went to Oxford University, you'll be listed there. Um, and I found my school, St John's School in Leatherhead. Turns out 463 people are on LinkedIn who went to the same school as me. Not necessarily at the same time, but there are 463 people on there. And I thought, oh, this is interesting. And I, I, I never did like Robin, but there you go. So I'm thinking, this is interesting. What else can I find out that's going on here? LinkedIn gives me a bit more information. It shows me where they live. Here am I asking people for fights on LinkedIn. Turns out, that 25 of them are on my doorstep. I've already got something in common with these people. If I get my messaging bit right, there's no earthly reason I can't end up in a coffee shop with these people. Who knows where that'll go? Shows me where they live, shows me where they work, and if you can see, look at the names of the companies in here. PwC, Deloitte, Surrey County Council, American Express, Imperial College, GSK, Adobe, BP. Goodness me. They all have conferences, they all hire trainers, and it shows me who works there, what they do there. Then I found another button, where they, what they studied, what they're good at, and then here is the awful truth 
that I let my father down. I'm only connected to four people that went to the same school as me. I let him down. Now, I get the old boys network. It turned, the magazine turns up every six months. First place I go is the obituary section. Don't ask me why. But there's the opportunity, yeah? Those numbers there. I've already got something in common with these people. I could just spend a couple of months just going through the people who went to the same school as me. Hi, Sue. I see we both went to St John's. What was it like when you were there? Do you remember this? What clubs were you a member of? All that kind of stuff. Easy peasy when you know how, yeah? This is brand new. Uh, some of you might have this. Most of you probably won't, but live streaming on LinkedIn. I could essentially pick my mobile phone up and I could stream this workshop we've done today out onto LinkedIn if I wanted to. LinkedIn Learning, I mentioned earlier, there's a whole hidden area there. I mean, this stuff isn't hidden, you just got to search around for it. Training videos on a whole variety of different topics. Leadership, sales, customer service, all this good stuff. How to use PowerPoint, how to create and use Excel, it's all sitting there. Um, you can also, I won't do it this time um, because I've just moved it around. But what you can also do is click a button on the LinkedIn app and it will show you who is on LinkedIn, who is physically near to you right now. So financial advisors that put on seminars could use this. Everybody could get their mobile phones out and you press this button and it shows everybody who's sitting in the room by magic. And then what you could do is you can connect with people there and then. Instant community there and then. So we're going to start to wrap up now and what would be a good idea until the others come in we'll just take a few questions, anything specific you've got to go. So here's the most important bit of all though, have a plan. So, so important you have a plan. Back of an envelope job, absolutely fine, but be clear about what it is that you're trying to achieve. Tell stories, people by people. There's a guy uh, I know, a speaker friend of mine, you, one or two might have heard of him, Richard McCann. Ever of you come across Richard McCann? Uh, one of the, certainly the UK's top motivational speakers, um, increasingly around the world. Richard McCann, uh, at the risk of ruining his story, but most people know his story, is that his mother was the first victim of the Yorkshire Ripper, Peter Sutcliffe. And his story is from the day the police turned up when he was about seven or eight years old, the day they turned up and right up to present day and how his life spiralled out of control, how he ended up in jail, how one day he ended up going to the same jail that Peter Sutcliffe was in, how he pulled his, himself up, got a job, got in with the wrong people, life spiralled back down again, but how he's now a huge me a mentor uh, for, for people all around the world. And that's his story. Um, and he tells little stories, he's absolutely superb on LinkedIn, tiny little stories about things that he's doing, people he's met, just tell stories. The best kind of stories are what I've just told you. They're called epiphany stories. And an epiphany story is um, where you started off in life, you were going in a particular direction, yeah, maybe you had a goal or dream, but there was this brick wall in your life that you just couldn't get over. And then maybe one day you saw a Tony Robbins video and you got over the wall. The light bulbs came on and the rest is this. That's an epiphany story. And anything that you can tell where humans have faced adversity, it doesn't have to be you, is a great thing to post. So I see quite a few financial advisors who are, who are doing this well, telling case to client case studies, uh, particularly if they're involved in the protection market where a family were, you know, didn't have critical illness or they did have critical illness. Those kind of stories are super powerful. As somebody mentioned this morning, one of the best things we've got going for us as a profession is how we change lives. And anything like that that you can get into, status updates, people absolutely love that stuff. So tell stories. Treat LinkedIn as an asset of your business. Hopefully, just from what you've heard this afternoon, you're getting the idea this is not just some website that somebody told you you ought to be using it. Get it right, 
it's amazing what this website can do for you. So it's an asset of your business, just as your photocopier is and all the rest of it. Where are we going to go with all this? So if you, if you book a flight on KLM Airlines uh, and you're out in Europe, when you go onto the KLM Airlines website, you'll be able to choose who you sit next to based on their LinkedIn profile. <laughs> so you might think, oh, that's a bit creepy. But some of you might be hardcore networkers. I'm not going to waste two hours sitting on an airplane. I'm going to help people out. That's where this stuff's going. Uh, if you want more, I have a community called LinkedIn Marketing Secrets um, at that address there where everything you've heard today and so much more, every single day, tips, links, resources, ideas, stuff no one else knows about, about on LinkedIn. Just join, it's free to join. And uh, a load of tons of stuff. If you know any students who are interested in using LinkedIn to find a career, look up universities, start following influencers. This is available now on Kindle or paperback out there on Amazon. It's a quick read, um, but it's, it's great fun. Now this started life when I go into schools and talk about LinkedIn to, to teenagers um, and why they need to start getting their heads around professional social networking. This started out as a little handout that I used to give to the teachers to do them. Um, and I've realized, my goodness, there's the basic basis of a book. There's something that can sit on a value ladder. And each and every one of you could do this. There are people around the world right now making millions of pounds just selling 25-page Kindle guides on any topic under the sun. 25 pages. You don't even need to write it. You can go onto a website like guru.com and hire someone to write a little guide or a little book on something that you're interested in, be it golf, whatever. Upload it to Amazon, set a price, could be a couple of quid, couple of dollars, watch the money come in. If you could get 15 short guides on Amazon, on average you'll earn about 500 pounds a month each for each one. Um, and I think this is the massive big trick that our profession is missing. Taking our expertise, repackaging it into other formats, and then selling it to people who actually want to buy it. Sorry? Guru. Just guru.com. A bit more to it than that, but that's basically how it's done. So, have we found this useful? Excellent. See, I did it again. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time. Hope you enjoyed it. If you want the slides, just give us your business card and I'll sort that out for you with some other secret stuff. Thanks a lot. Thank you.